Buonasera e benvenuti. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We're now uh, having a meeting with the INET lecture, i.e. a set of uh, meetings organized by the Institute of New Economic uh, Thinking. Uh, this is an alternative to uh, the economic mainstream. And now we're going to give the floor to a political scientist uh, uh, who uh, ha has a main approach to that of multidisciplinarity. Uh, we're going to hear from Thomas Ferguson. I am very pleased to say that INET Lecture, organizing these uh, um, set of meetings in the general framework of the Economics Festival, donated 120 scholarships for students. Uh, to foster research in economics, drawing inspiration from contamination and uh, trying to make economics um, a multidisciplinary, or to see that with a multidisciplinary approach. Andy Aldane, Robert McChesney, Wang Gui, Marcello Giacecco and Sarah Storms and Rob Jones have been so far involved, and they are all sitting on the board of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. The director of research projects and a member of its advisory board is indeed Professor Thomas Ferguson. I'm now going to read his uh, uh, resume. He's also Professor of Political Science. Um, he has a chair of the University of Massachusetts and senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. He taught at the MIT and the University of Texas. He published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, uh, International Organization, International Studies Quarterly, and the Journal of Economic History. He also serves on the advisory board of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He writes frequently as an intellectual for all topical subjects in the international debate for the Huffington Post, the Salon, and uh, he's also contributed to um, Alternet. He's the author and uh, or co-author of several books, including The Golden Rule uh, and um, Right Turn together with uh, Rogers. He's now going to devote uh, himself to one of our uh, central subjects among the different uh, topics uh, covered by this edition of the Economics Festival. The title of his presentation is The, the Political Parties of the, world, of the First World of Advanced Capitalistic Econ Economies. The lecture by Professor Ferguson is going to show that based on one of the approach that he contributed to development, uh, that of the investment free of politics, uh, that unlike more conventional um, uh, theories on the median voters, uh, uh, there are different weights and counterweights when it comes to voting capacity and the possibility to mm, influence uh, the debate uh, in uh, liberal democracies. There are a number of votes that weigh more than others. There are decisions that are more influential than others. These influencers are lobbies, groups, financial elites, representing, again, the very subject matter of today's presentation. Having said as much, I'd like to give the floor to Professor Thomas Ferguson. Very much, Ms. Milano. Um, look, I uh, am very happy to be here, not just because your city's beautiful and because it's sort of amazing to be in a place where you see pictures of economists hanging around as though it were, you know, a Venetian festival or something. Uh, but I have to confess, I was raised, I suspect as many here were, as a Catholic. And if you know the peculiar history of the American Catholic Church, it is just the case that um, the spirit of the Council of Trent went with a special force into American Catholicism after 1910 or so. And in that sense, I grew up hearing about Trent, Trent, Trent all the time. 
uh, and so when I got here, I had that peculiar sensation that I'd been living here all my life. Uh, and, you know, I, of course, I also appreciate the irony uh, that uh, this is the place where, in some sense, the first effort to get Europe to stay together blew up. Right? I mean, because that was the inner meaning of the first efforts in the Council of Trent. Then they went around and sort of took what I would call a Cold War hardline uh, on re a religious doctrine. Well, all right. Um, at the same time, I also have to confess it's pretty humbling to show up here. I mean, I speak several European languages. I don't speak Italian, and what keeps flooring me uh, is that I run into people who speak four, five, and six languages making me, as I sort of sit there with a couple, just sort of, just not so great. So the only thing I can do in this is take refuge in what uh, an Arkansas politician back about 1910 said, that if English was good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. <laughs> now, I actually, uh, I think one more little regional anecdote. Yes, I taught at the University of Texas. And there, uh, I admit, I was influenced by my environment. It's hard to convey to any audience like this. Uh, at, when I was there, it was the early 80s, and Texas was still probably the energy capital of the world. Uh, and it, its spirit was eh, a mix of frontier and late model capitalism. Uh, and, you know, you'd actually run into people in various bars who would actually say things like, how many of the downtrodden did you trod on today? Uh, but uh, the story that I want to sort of just highlight, because it does affect uh, what my, my main message here, um, is a true story about an argument between a dean and a president of the University of Texas. And basically the dean said to the president, they were contemplating some step, and he said, Frank, that's a conflict of interest. And the president just looked at him and said, John, where there's no conflict, there's no interest. <laughs> now, that's where we get, let me uh, move to my first slide here. Well, that didn't work, okay. Now, I want to talk about theories and evidence in of political parties in, well, I said first world, that was just casual. I meant relatively rich countries. I'm not trying to explain uh, medium, si uh, medium countries or small ones where I regret to say in many cases what you actually have is a sort of not very subtle form of kleptocracy or something where the ruler just owns everything or nearly so. Um, I'm sort of interested in what used to be called advanced capitalist societies. I believe the term now is of choice is of art is uh, free market democracies or something. Well, whatever. This is what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I want to take off after I, I heard yesterday, uh, I want to sort of make this problem very concrete. Yesterday I heard a very good presentation, very elegant, um, on the Eurozone crisis. And the focus of that presentation was on the European Central Bank. And the main point uh, it put before the House was, well, the bank's position vis-a-vis -vis the countries in the Eurozone was quite undemocratic because it was subject to no political authority. And terrifyingly, especially if you're a banker, could not be compelled to redeem its promise to do whatever it takes to support the Eurozone financial system. And so the suggestion was that the Eurozone political elites need to stop substituting bureaucratic in integration for democratic integration. And the analysis of the design of the system focused heavily on differences in unit labor costs. Now, my reaction on this draws heavily on a couple papers at, at a recent INET conference in Grenoble. Um, one was by Service Storm and C.W. Nastapod there, and the other was by Arturo O'Connell. And in the background is just a, uh, the balance sheet recession notion developed by Richard Coop. And, you know, my take is this analysis is not really very helpful. Basically, I think if you look at the Eurozone in those two papers with Coup in the background, you get a relatively straightforward approach to this, which is, especially after the crisis of the Neumarkt in Germany, German and other banks, French, American, UK, UK were looking for business, and they had plenty of funds. People were still making deposits. Uh, so they, met, they sent a swirl of money into southern Europe. 
read peripheral Europe. Uh, and the wave looks a lot like the financial crises in Latin America and elsewhere that have happened recurrently. Now, my take and lots of other people's, really nicely documented by Storm and Nastapad, is this inflow of funds drives up wages, especially construction wages, and, and, and then fuels a bubble. Now, the wage rise is a consequence of the capital inflow. It's not that everybody's rushing off to live way beyond their means. Um, and, you know, in this view, the whole Eurozone crisis derives from a failure to restrain the banks. Um, put it another way, uh, uh, the, when you're talking about design flaws in the euro, start with the failure to have any uh, effective control over banks, or to sort of put it as I do with the right of the, the Eden of a big integrated market that people were the vision here of sugar plums dancing in their heads, was in fact unprepared for the Godzillas and King Kongs that were looming over the landscape, the too big to fail banks. Now, and in the question period, there was a really good question that came out, and oh, by the way, did you notice that the countries bailed out the banks? What's so democratic about that? I mean, these were supposed, and uh, let me just show you a little point from a paper I did with Rob Johnson. Um, you can see that political structure sort of mattered. The dark colored dots are countries that took some penalties out of the banks. The ones with holes there sort of looking like donuts uh, on the lower left and bottom are countries that asked for almost nothing or in some cases nothing initially. Now, the later responses were sometimes different. But the point was you could see there are some political structure differences. If you looked at voter turnout, and the percentage of socialist deputies in the parliament. You have to accept my characterizations of uh, which of these, you know, in some sense, made the banks pay, but it's, it's not very hard. You do get some kind of a clear separation, but my real message here is not uh, that people haven't been paying attention to this, it's that nobody did very well. I mean, the, at most, I mean, the Germans are right now trying to sell the 25% share of Commerzbank uh, that they took. Uh, but that's, you know, the Commerce Bank folks, they too are still in business. Okay, now, this is where I want to, if you now fast forward to the Eurozone, um, I would characterize the European crisis quite differently. It's just that the countries took over the private debts of the banks. Not all of them, they're still out there, some places, a lot of them, but they did. Um, that blew up the country debt to GDP ratios and frightened investors. So the, the European Central Bank rescued both the investors um, and the banks and the countries with that outright monetary uh, transaction policy. The, and the point is simply, well, the central banks of the, uh, of the countries buy the country debt, the investors and the countries are reassured and the banks live on. The rest of you aren't so lucky. I mean, there's effectively ordinary Europeans don't get much in the way, but bailout. To me and to my colleague Peter Temin, where we were working on this question last month, look, Europe seems to us quite like in 1930. That is to say, uh, nothing's really been resolved, the, except this time the banks appear to be safe. But there's no real growth impulse. And as some talks yesterday vividly illustrated, many countries had debt to GDP ratios that are going up, not down. Um, and it, this, what's scary about this uh, is that in this type of situation, you're just sort of sitting there like an ocean liner with all its lights out and no power in the ocean waiting for a shock. In that type of situation, we know what happens. This should be now much easier to sort of comprehensible after the recent European parliamentary elections, what you get is a very simple rule. It was, is true in many countries in the um, 30s. It's true now, which is you get in, out, out, in political oscillations where whoever in power gets voted out, uh, they roll somebody else in. Um, when they continue with the same austerity policies, they go back out. After four or five years, all the swamp creatures start coming out. Uh, and you get uh, the center, political centers just dissolved. That process is clearly far underway in Europe now. 
Um, and so uh, the reason I want to talk, to deliver the talk I want to now, uh, is I think you need to sort of learn to talk about banks. Um, it's like, is there something wrong with the political analysis that I, just about everything I see and everything I read? Uh, I'm not claiming that the American version of this is much better, uh, but there is some work on the question. But in, in, if you look at politics and journalism, uh, pretty much everywhere in Europe, I think I, I, the Europeans were all agreeing with me last night, so I don't think I've actually missed uh, that much stuff. When you, the, the basic analytical approach people take to analyzing elections just about is this, what political science and economics calls the median voter approach. Forget all that stuff. It's just think of it as uh, some form of election where the voters sitting somewhere in the middle of the distribution where you get the most votes settles the election. They, all they mean to be saying there is some version of plurality or majority rules, which depends on the exact rule. Uh, I've always, I've written and said there's a huge problem with that position. It's not very difficult to figure out what it is. It relies uh, on the view that, you know, everything you hear uh, is all there is to say. And the problem is, is that no political position before the electorates can be uh, presented unless it can be financed. Um, and, you know, at the bottom of this, when you look at it, is when you look at the classical democratic theories, like Mill or Locke uh, in the sort of English tradition, it, what you'll typically see is that they sort of take it for granted that you know, the electorate, whoever out there is voting, and in Locke, it's hardly anybody. Uh, in Mill, it, on the other hand, it's many more people. Um, is that it's pretty easy and cheap to sort of get political information, reach a decision, uh, and that folks just sort of know somehow pretty fast how to do everything and understand it. Um, my take is that's a huge problem. It's plain wrong. Uh, and so uh, you got to actually deal seriously with, if you like, the costs of democracy. And this comes very quickly to a simple story. Uh, either you find some way to pay the costs of democracy in a way that in effect either all of us pay a little or a few folks pay a lot and they end up with most of the power in the system. So that power passes by default to organized interest groups and major investors. Or what I sometimes say in my slogan on this now, I, under, I agree that the U.S. is the case study of this, but it's, the U.S. is unfortunately showing the rest of the world the way there, I think. Um, political parties these days are mostly bank accounts uh, and, and not a whole lot else. So the question is, is how do you organize, analyze political parties? That's what I want to talk about just briefly. Uh, and let me just sort, I'm going to, this is a bit of a jawbreaker, but hey, this is an economics festival, and I'll come back at it fairly simply fast. Um, what you want to do is try to imagine, uh, if you like, blocks of investors, which could be people investing a vast amounts of time, typically they are not, I assume all of you know the, by now it's, as far as I can tell, it's a cliche even over here, the sort of dwindling turnouts in just about everybody's form of election in every country at every level. Uh, in the U.S., we're used to that. Uh, we have t a history of voter turnout that looks like Coney Island, uh, that is to say a roller coaster uh, in many cases going down. I mean, people won't believe this, but it is true. Uh, between about 1900 and 1950 or so, turnouts in elections in Georgia um, ran about six to seven percent of the total electorate, no more. I mean, anyway, that you're, you're not anywhere near that, and our voter turnouts are typically uh, a lot higher than that, but still way short, typically, on European constraints. Anyway, um, what I want to do is talk about how do you do this for a little bit, and frankly, my pitch is I think it's time the Europeans get into analyzing political systems in somewhat different way. Because uh, I don't think we can go on like this. If you, if you cannot find a way to analyze the power of banks and other large firms in both countries and the European Union as a whole, this is going to be the second. Well, this time I guess it won't be Trento, 
But here in Trento, we'll be talking uh, in effect about why Europe dissolves again. Because I, I'm certainly not trying to tell you that you know, I think people should pull out of the European Union or anything like that. I'm saying that if, the, if you can't figure out a way to get a serious analysis of power, then probably the European Union will come to a political shock. I'd bet faster than most people on that. And uh, if I had to guess, my candidate would be France, as so often in European history. But never mind. Anyway, um, I, I, I'm going to just drop a couple things I want to talk. Let, let me just ask you to imagine this. The, I, I think the first problem, what, what particularly stymies most sort of people coming from Europe in some forms of political analysis is they're used to thinking in terms of political party systems that have labor on one side and then business groups on the other. For a while in Sweden, it was like heavenly made that because the, there was a labor, a, a labor party that sometimes called itself a socialist party, and for a while the business party actually took the name the bourgeois party. You know, and it's hard to tell anybody there. Uh, you just don't need to tell anybody much about that. The problem is, is that that approach is pretty foolish. Now, we learn this in the United States. In many cases, it's foolish. We learn this very simply in the United States because until the New Deal, there were no interesting political forces of labor in American history. After the New Deal, it's perfectly obvious that the Democratic Party had a tie to labor. It was also equally obvious, if you ever looked, at even the Roosevelt cabinets or his political supporters or the political money that they weren't mostly about labor. Uh, and by the time Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy were president, well, the Johnson cabinet is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. It was basically just an, an endless array of multinational business executives. I think there was one labor guy in the cabinet for much of the period. But this was some kind of very strange business labor party, and it flummoxed a lot of folks. It's not hard to understand. If you've got a weak labor uh, situation, then you'll find some businesses go into coalition with them. If you want to sort of work out the theory of this, I think you can sort of see what on average might be an important case, which is, hey, it's the people who are in capital intensive industries where labor doesn't matter much as costs that really are the type you're most likely to see. When you do a statistical study of this, that's what you find. Um, and then you can imagine, you can cross, so if you'd imagine, and in, in Europe today, it's perfectly obvious that most of the labor parties have long ago de-radicalized. I mean, the, the socialist parties, I mean, in France, there was always this funny thing. The socialists weren't socialist going back probably to the 1880s, uh, but hey, um, the socialist parties are now, in many cases, simply obvious business parties, sometimes of factions, sometimes of patronage. I would accept the analysis that says because some of the European parties have due structures, that those parties are somewhat more independent. But everybody knows the dues don't cover uh, the real costs of this. Uh, there was a great little book called The Labor Party PLC, Public Limited Company, uh, by a guy who sort of showed you how the British Labor Party was hollowed out. In many cases, you can do this. I mean, in France, it's political clubs uh, that are important and largely unrecorded. In, um, in Britain, Tony Blair established an office that while the party didn't take much money from businesses, Blair's office did uh, before he was becoming, while he was in his campaign to become prime minister, and so on and so forth. My point is you've got to start talking about politics and money. Now, I, in a minute, I want to show you some things you can do with this, but let me make a couple of qualifications. I take the point that the evidence can be hard come by, though I've worked in the French and the uh, British and the German records, and I think there's enough data there in all of those that people could do things. They just don't do it uh, there. Moreover, we know from the last 12 or 15 years, people have learned how to use eh, rocket science. Uh, advanced statistics. Um, you can do so-called event analysis. This was actually pioneered by a colleague of mine at the University of Texas, and he couldn't get the paper published for ages. Um, just to tell you the flavor of it, what he was doing was looking at cases where politicians died unexpectedly. Uh, and 
what he, because that's be unexpected, what he found is the firms they were close to, their stock dropped that afternoon. For a lot of folks, they've never quite taken just how integrated this business is. But he, lots of people have done event analyses now of uh, politics and um, <clears throat> corporations. And if you can't find any other evidence, try this one. But before I sort of go on about the stuff I want to talk about, which is actual political money, I want to just a couple of things here. Um, I want to warn you, this is from a diagram again that Rob Johnson and I put together for a paper. The thing you want, this is the salaries of regulators and regulated. And this sends, you know, a really interesting message on financial regulation, right? This is over time, and I think you sort of get it right off, which is that the regulators make much less than the regulated. Guess what that does? Uh, it tends to turn uh, the regulated um, into the people who then try to hire the regulators. Uh, now, you know, in France, bank supervision virtually canonizes this. The people in the Ministry of Finance go on to run the banks. That's one reason I think French bank supervision is terrible for a very long time. Uh, but in the U.S., it was put to me by a former uh, regulator, they function as employment agencies for the regulated. That's scary enough, but take my point here, which is this has nothing to do with directly political money at all. If you're looking for any general factor that's important here, it's sheer inequality. And I think this is actually becoming everywhere in the world a major factor. Put bluntly, um, at the top, as salaries pull away from the rest of the population everywhere, uh, the government structures at the top tend to emulate the very top of the private sector. I mean, it, it is quite striking if you look at U.S. presidential libraries. Most folks for who were president of the United States had none at all. Franklin Roosevelt left a small library with a small legacy. Now you get in the last three or four presidents with very, I mean, what I'd call an edifice complex, very large libraries, and, and I believe the Obama target for the Obama library is $500 million, which he's trying to raise while he's in office uh, for that. Anyway, um, so I, I'm, not, I'm far from telling you that uh, this is just a problem of political money in a narrow sense. And let me just make another point. Let's look at the spectrum of political money for a second. Um, and um, uh, this, I'm quite struck, just to sort of look through the spectrum for a second here. In the US, this is declared. In other cases, it is not always, but you can sometimes find it. Most German members of parliament are allowed to take seats on boards and things and get paid for it. Um, I noticed that some people who seem to think that INET they call, I mean, somebody in a Handelsblatt actually had the gall to write, well, their uh, INET is a, uh, some kind of front for international finance. I'd like to see Handelsblatt start to cover political finance the way I do. Uh, and if you know any Handelsblatt correspondents, you can take that challenge back to them. Um, anyway, the, um, at any rate, we get lots of payments to political figures. Uh, U.S. political administrations, essentially everybody that goes into the White House as an advisor has some of these. Uh, my favorite was a White House economic advisor who claimed to, he was being paid just under a million dollars by an investment firm for advising on philanthropy. Those of you who think about this for five seconds will realize, when was the last time you saw anybody get paid a million dollars for philanthropy uh, as an advice uh, capacity? That's pretty obviously a polite way of uh, keeping somebody in circulation until they can put them on, sort of like the payments that were formally signed by the last Treasury Secretary from Citigroup, uh, which said, you know, if you go into public life, you can keep the cash uh, that, we're, and that you're going to get in a bonus. Well, anyway, um, lobbying money's huge. Now, I understand the European countries all have different systems of lobbying, and in in, particularly in France or in Germany, it's somewhat narrower. You also all know that in Brussels, the American system has taken hold, and it is everywhere coming in, as far as I can tell, in every country, though where you have an, uh, a ministry formally, as it were, inviting folks to lobby, w w it, you, it restricts that a bit, but not much. Um, we now see think tanks, I think, everywhere in Europe. 
some of those do some thinking. They're more tanks, in my opinion, than uh, thought. Um, we know that um, in the United States, some good studies have been done on charitable grants, especially most corporations have charities now. It turns out that they have a funny tendency to be especially interested in projects frequented by the spouses of, for instance, congressmen and women. Um, and it's a lot of money. Um, there is the famous many lawyers' fees, as George Stigler said ages ago. The great thing about uh, having a lawyer uh, or paying a lawyer is that you can pay them for something legal, um, and you know, that's the end of it. Um, a, a point I want to make, uh, the business of stock tips has gotten really quite interesting. There are some good papers on this, um, though there is some conflicting evidence, but uh, one great paper by Alan Zabrowski and his colleagues um, showed you that the highest rates of return in recorded history uh, over about eight or ten years were for U.S. senators, that not George Soros, not Warren Buffett, not anybody could rank with those folks uh, in the way. Now, I mean, if you think about that five seconds, you understand what I'm really telling you and what Zabrowski was telling you, uh, which was they're just being handed stock tips. I mean, you know, you can take that home. That's not election money uh, there. Okay. And finally, there is formal campaign spending, a lot of public uh, relations spending, and as somebody pointed out after a talk I gave here, uh, and I added it to the list, yeah, there are a lot of media companies that give book contracts. The Murdoch Empire has done tons of that. They were giving Chinese politicians, American politicians, uh, and some Asian politicians, as well as British politicians, contracts uh, for large books. They may or may not deliver the book, but they get the money. Now. Um, I get challenged all the time, can you show that any of this stuff matters? And so I introduce my favorite graph. I admit, this thing, in terms of any orthodox political science approach, just shouldn't be there. And my challenge to younger researchers here is, I lay odds you could do this uh, for in, in European, in some European parliamentary elections. In particular, I think the data is a, maybe available for France. I know I've been down in that office and looked at them. But um, what I do here is, with my colleagues, now I should say this is not just my work, uh, Ji Chen and Paul Jorgensen work with me, and uh, we published this. We run democratic money, the percentage of money to Democrats in the U.S. House races on the bottom, and then, you know, running up the top, uh, is the vote margin. You know, at both ends you get zero and a hundred, running with no opponents. Basically what you're seeing there is about the closest straight line relationship you'll ever see. Now, in t there is a technical objection to this that you can do, uh, which is to say, well, you know, maybe they're just giving the money to popular people or something like that. Um, now, there's a couple approaches to this. First of all, it becomes more unbelievable as you go from election to election. And what we found is that in every election we've looked at, you get this linear relationship. Um, you also get it for U.S. Senate elections, and we know that holds for something like a 24-year period. Um, the, uh, but more broadly, what you'd like to do in a, st in a situation like this is you'd like to introduce an instrumental variable uh, to uh, give you a, a control. The problem with instrumental variables in political science is basically everybody ends up staring at each other, as in econometrics in general, and asking themselves, do you think this is plausible or not? This bothers me. So we are actually, my, I actually found a thesis that uh, works with latent uh, instrumental variables, and my colleagues and I are probably four days away or so from doing that, we need a spatial version of this because although hardly anyone analyzes U.S. House elections in spatial terms, they are in space. And I mean, for those of you who are into statistics, you should understand immediately spatial autocorrelation is a problem. Anyway, um, what this shows you is that uh, House elections for the United States likely are, I mean, with the qualification I just said, hugely money driven. Is my, um, and uh, this is a little terrifying because House elections get some coverage. I actually think what this is a warning about local elections where they get no coverage, and as perhaps some of you know, 
in the U.S. It's obviously less, well de less far along here in Italy where I can see people actually still reading newspapers. I can't believe it. Uh, here, I mean, there are like six or eight of them in the hotel I'm in, and they seem actually to be read. This doesn't happen in the United States much, um, but the, uh, where a lot of towns have no newspaper at all. Uh, and I suspect in local elections you've got a true zoo, but at any rate, the House elections look like that. Um, the Senate elections look like that, though, with wider scatter. Um, and in the presidential elections are a little different. They're a one-off. So let me talk a bit. Uh, I want to just quick focus here. I'm almost done. Uh, but the, I, I want to quick focus on what U.S. presidential elections look like. And here what I want to show you is a size breakdown uh, of, of contributions. Now, I should caution that you know, there are a lot of these size breakdowns floating around out here. This is probably the only one you want to believe. The problems are overwhelming in consolidating U.S. election statistics, and my colleagues and I solved this problem, which I don't think anybody else has, by basically taking computer programs designed for things like Massachusetts General Hospital, where they have to admit all kinds of patients with name changes. Trying to standardize names is an, an overwhelm. It's just a single person's contribution may have 20 different name variants with different addresses, for example. Anyway, we do this. Um, my point is simply, what's total money look like? Below 250, it's um, neither, in the 2012 case where Obama, Obama and Romney were the candidates, the, um, you can see the dip. Where's the big cash here? It's in the 1,000 to 10,000, the 10,000 to 100,000, and the uh, above 100,000. My conclusion, you just add all those together, and everybody tends to come out uh, with the majority of their cash coming from what I'd call the 1%. Now, we can all argue about what the 1% is. There are all kinds of criteria. If you take an Economist magazine article of some years back, they wanted to use a threshold of about 350,000. A New York Times put in a claim for about uh, 500,000, never mind all that crap. These are just details. Uh, what, what actually, the real story here is if you can, I think if you can do contributions over 500 bucks, uh, you probably belong in the 1%, but if you don't, just use the 1,000 to 10,000. Uh, and I, I have to conclude that uh, American politics is a game of the super rich. Um, this, now, this stuff includes uh, corporate contributions for a variety of ways. I, we, just do not, we just don't have time to go into that. Um, I want to look at some breakdowns in a minute. I want to add a word. There is also some non-itemized money not shown in that table. I thought I brought the table, but I didn't. Don't, don't look at table three here. Uh, look at me for a second more, and then you know I understand. My, my children long ago said to me, Dad, you have the perfect radio face. Um, so then you can go look at that. Uh, but I just need your attention on this point. There is a... Um, you can add up the unitemized contributions, and we did it. And what you find is pretty interesting. When you sum all the unitemized contributions, um, which means contributions from small, they're less than $200. When you do that, you find the Democrats have about twice as many as the Republicans. Uh, but even under, in Obama's case, it adds to only about 35% of his cash, meaning all the stuff I just showed you when you sum it all up. Uh, you still get that same 1% dominance uh, out there. Um, on the other hand, you know, I'd offer this as a caution there are a lot of folks walking around saying, you know, the, the effectively or ordinary folks have zero impact in elections. I'm a little cautious about that because of those, the sum totals there, they're not zero. When they go to no, zero, you'll know it. And it's beginning to us to look like they're close to zero in many congressional elections. But in the presidential race, you can still get some money from ordinary people. Now, um, this then leads to my main plea to European researchers and everybody else. I'm not going to spend a lot of time analyzing American politics, or I don't want to do it. Um, but like the way I have liked to work for many years is you take, you break out the big business contributions from everything else. Um, I'm telling you that's not an assumption. I think you can make a case 
that the large firms dominate. If you don't, do it your way, it's fine, but do it. Um, but the point I, I want to make here uh, is you can see how much, how hyperactive, as it were, the big business firms are. Um, the all means the whole sample of business, which is the entirety of all contributions and everybody we can identify. We didn't do any sampling here. We took the Federal Election Commission numbers, put them all together, uh, and did it from scratch. Uh, my point is, yeah, the large firms are really super active. But I would also note this, which so many people believe. I have a very hard time, especially talking my Italian friends out of this who are convinced, usually rightly, that there's some peculiar fix going on in most Italian electoral uh, machinations, which is it's not the case that all businesses contribute equally to everybody. It's not even uh, logically plausible that they could do that, though that's another argument. Um, the point is, is that there are real differences between firms, where, you, where this method becomes really interesting and really powerful and where you get stuff you can see no place else is if you take the contributions apart by sectors, but you can take it, you can go way down inside those sectors too. I just, hey, I got a table and I want to stop. Um, but if you look uh, at there, uh, Look at the input. You can see a number of things from this. I will just ask you to believe this. This is actually out in an, in an article in the International Journal of Political Economy. So I guess my pitch is read my article, my, my, that of my article and my colleagues. Don't read my lips. But here I am. So uh, if you look at coal mining, paper, chemicals, oil, utilities, these folks are giant polluters. They're overwhelming. And the, you can see the sort of split between Obama and Romney. And you can see where I have big business only under those. The, this is a really interesting result. If you have the feeling, and you know, which would admittedly, if you were paying any attention, which can be tough in American campaigns. But if you're paying attention to what people say, it was just obvious that the Republican nominee and all of his friends simply hated uh, the idea of regulation of pollution. Uh, and the uh, Democrats, by contrast, Obama, who I, I am not a big fan of, but he did one thing really right that was kind of historic, which was when he uh, saved, when the administration saved General Motors, they actually told the, and uh, helped along the Chrysler merger, obviously of interest to Italians, um, the, uh, with Fiat. Um, the, he also insisted that they accept a vast increase in mileage standards for automobiles. That broke an oil uh, company, car company kind of cartel, which had been in place really since for about 35 years with no progress at all on that. Because I, I will tell you, having done this recently, I had to give a lecture on climate change and industrial uh, policy. It is perfectly obvious that mileage standards really do affect uh, pollution levels uh, in countries. I'm not trying to tell you that everything is wonderful if you have them. Just go to the U.S. in a big city or go to China and take a deep breath and you'll sort of get the point. But um, they do matter. Anyway, um, I actually think I will stop here. There's plenty more that could be said out of this table. Here, let me just try to summarize my point. You've got to give up this pure focus on elections results where you're simply like doing regressions of voters. You, you've got to just stop doing uh, rhetorical analysis of campaigns. You actually need to look at where the money comes from, not just in the campaigns, but how it goes to folks. I am very struck by the enormous numbers of corruption scandals floating around essentially in just about every European country. I mean, since, since I landed about two weeks ago in this place, like the head of the UMP, France had to resign uh, for yet another scandal. They go all the time. And it's perfectly obvious to me that as you go to this society in which the 1% make more and more and more of whatever there is to make, and still understanding that there are very large differences across countries in this, your political systems are becoming highly distorted. When you're talking about the euro, you need to remember that. If you hear people talking to you about 
Uh, what do we need in the form of euro regulation or democracy? And they're not able to mention the word banks or they don't have, I mean, if you're talking about democracy, I mean, the European parliamentary rules on conflict of interest are outrageously weak. Everybody knows it um, and people exploit it. Um, they, you, you've got to get serious about money in politics uh, or, you know, what happened, you know, four or five hundred years ago at the first Council of Trent when Europe broke apart, it will break again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Thomas Ferguson, for this very lovely portrait of contemporary democracies and the role of make money and big business into them. Especially connections with politics and elections. So there's a mic available. So if you want to raise questions, just raise your hand. If you want to ask questions, just raise your hands and uh, you'll be given the mic. There's somebody asking for the floor at the bottom of the hall. Professor, you already said that your presentation, your lecture, would be based on the North American perspective, and we quite understood that. But as some point, you said that yesterday you les listened to a lecture on the Eurozone and on the possibility to have the European Central Bank lend money to safeguard the Euro and the Eurozone. I believe that this is another case, that this is certainly something that the European Central Bank sh could do. Then you referred to the breaking up of the Eurozone. You said that the politics have to be wary to avoid that. But do you think that lobbies that are so powerful within European democracies and uh, as well as in the world democracies, do you really think that lobbyists would advocate uh, the breaking up of the Eurozone that would go against their own interests? I shouldn't think so. What do you think? Do you think that lobbies would be for that? I personally uh, don't believe this is the case. Then the second question uh, concerning banks. European banks had problems uh, with the derivatives as pushed forward by the lobbies and corporations uh, in the US. And I don't see how anybody would profit from the explosion of the Eurozone. I agree with you when you say that lobbies might try to make their own business and to profit themselves, as is the case for North uh, European democracies vis-a-vis um, -vis the, um, the big businesses. What would you like to do? What do you think? I think that you can answer. OK. Um, okay, let me just try to answer that. I'm going to, I don't want to cut the question down inadvertently, but as I take it, the question is what do I think is the situation with European big business uh, in the Eurozone? <clears throat> now, let me just say, this depends on the country. First of all, there in the UK, which admittedly is in, not inside the Euro, but in the Eurozone, uh, sorry, in the 
single market, as it were. Um, the, um, there was a letter published in the Daily Telegraph just about a week ago where a, lo a block of very prominent businessmen, basically they were all men too, by the way, um, they um, effectively said in a hardly veiled language that if uh, the Prime Minister Cameron didn't come down hard on the EU, they'd move to the UK IP. Now you can say to me, that's not the core of the Eurozone. I agree. But that's a really interesting case where you see a party emerging with some electoral success really appealing basically as far as I can tell against immigrants and everything else. I don't see that there's, and, uh, and obviously implicitly trashing austerity, though they don't have too much to say about that. Um, the, uh, th there for sure is some interaction between big business and these newer parties is emerging. Um, in the Eurozone itself, I don't think I'd, ex I would not expect many big businesses now to sort of go for that. Where you have a problem is where you could see this discussion, say, back in 2011 and 2012, there were several large uh, German business heads who were beginning to talk about, let's throw Greece out. They actually said it just like that, uh, saying it'd be too bad. Then that whole discussion was stilled when Merkel sort of who waved, went, wandered back and forth said, no, let's not do that. Um, and then of course came the Draghi, we'll do whatever it takes business. I, I think right now everybody in, all the big firms in Europe are pretty scared, but they're not, probably nobody going to move to, forward, to uh, try to knock it down. The question is what happens later? Now, I am not claiming, although I, I actually agree with Schäuble, I think the Front National in France is a fascist party, as the German finance minister said just about three days ago. Um, the, uh, but you know, lots of things were unthinkable early in the Great Depression for many big businesses. I mean, you can, if you doubt this, look at my piece with Joachim Fote in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2008. You can see exactly what I'm talking about. In the end, uh, as the situation got worse and the historical alternatives began to narrow themselves down, and as the political center dissolved, then you get big businesses taking really strange positions. I mean, my advice is don't, I mean, I wouldn't treat the e European Union the way eh, we all used to treat unbreakable phonograph records, you know, which was uh, believe they're unbreakable and don't worry about it. I mean, the advice is don't throw it on the floor. You might be surprised. So I think, no, now I wouldn't worry, but I'd worry later. I mean, that, that there is, in, in, I mean, I'm not kidding, folks. Uh, I think it is obvious that if you do not do something to relieve austerity on a large scale, the French electorate is going to become very strange, and it might not be fundamentally an electoral problem. Uh, France has a long history of such explosions. Thank you. Uh, I, I will uh, ask in English if you don't mind. Right, I don't mind. Yeah. So very interesting data. The, uh, I have two questions. One is, I really thank you for your consideration about Europe. But the first question is, <clears throat> based on your analysis, what has changed in the USA policy uh, historically uh, when more and more the, the big uh, company have influenced uh, uh, the politics, because if there is no change, then maybe there will be no change also in Europe. So you have not said what sort of change. The other question is, um, well, I think th this is the major question, because then we can go back to Europe and try to understand uh, uh, what, what can happen in Europe. Okay. Um, as I take that you want to know what difference does it make to the U.S.? I, I wasn't trying to do a full analysis of the U.S. I was trying to show you what you can do with data if somebody will make the effort. Um, now, in the case of the U.S., I have a long paper on Congress. <coughs> it's, well, they're the latest version's coming out in a book. It's easy up on the web. Uh, if you say, well, I gave it at an INET conference, it's up there. 
Um, if you type Thomas Ferguson INET Congress, it will almost certainly come up. Um, what I try to show you there uh, uh, is that the current partisan gridlock in the United States owes virtually nothing to disputes among the citizenry and differences of opinion. And it doesn't owe much to gerrymandering either, uh, uh, which is rewriting election districts, which is another favorite thing. It owes a lot to stalemates among large firms. I mean, basically, I think the paralysis of Congress and, frankly, of close to paralysis of the American government over the last 20 years is very plainly tied up to differences within big business. I mean, we, we simply can't argue this now, but at least I'm absolutely clear uh, on what I think is driving what uh, in that. Uh, so uh, then the question is, well, what about Europe? I, look, let me just make the point very simply. Um, if you believe that your interests are identical to either the 1% or large firms, you don't have to worry uh, about uh, the phenomenon I'm talking about. But, I mean, look. Most people would actually, I mean, I think it's pretty pathetic. Almost every European uh, younger person I meet in the whole of the South, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, and even Italy, they're all asking me questions like, how can I come to the United States? It's like, for you're looking here at an almost lost generation of people. I mean, it's pathetic. The youth unemployment situation, you know, you don't need me to tell you, was it 49% in Spain right now? Um, I mean, you got to get a government in there that is going to pay attention to these problems. If you don't, you're not going to solve it. There's nothing, I can't see any impulse in the European economy right now that offers any real promise uh, of this. I mean, the only thing I can see is that folks might do quantitative easing, uh, which could be read as a sort of very crude way to depreciate the currency for a while. That's a trick that can't go very far. And if you look at the Japanese depreciation uh, and what happened and the way they sort of had to stop it, you can sort of see some of the limits of that. In a weak demand world economy, competitive depreciations are not uh, the way to go. So I, I actually think it's a longer discussion. I don't want to dismiss the question, but that, that's my answer. First of all, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Uh, in one of the graphs that you showed us, we could see that one of the problems is that regulators earn much less than uh, p regulated people. Uh, does that, uh, am I right to think that it, this that graph basically implies that um, one of the potential p solutions would be to put restrictions on how rich people can become in the country so that they don't get more powerful than the government. You want, so I take it you want a view on that? All right, now, uh, yes, now, <laughs> uh, let me put it this way. I, I might. I myself think that when, well, they, they've been doing comparisons of the average human's wage, average production worker's wage in the, say, in the 60s uh, compared to the chief executive officer of the firm they worked for. It was about 25 to 1 in the 1960s. At points in, two th in the 21st century, it got up to something like 400 to 1. It bounced down when I last looked to something about 220 to 1. Now, I have to tell you that there is a piece of me that when I, I say, you know, maybe isn't 200 to 1 enough for any human? Um, but on the other hand, uh, I actually think your problem is probably not um, regulating individual uh, incomes. You need to get incomes up for the population. And then I, I actually, the line I push, now I admit this could uh, sound like pie in the sky. Uh, and I, you know, my usual caution that I tell people, if you want a happy ending guaranteed, see a Disney movie. Uh, the, but I, I suspect you could do a lot of things to make democratic procedures more robust. In particular, this. If you have serious public financing, what was said to be for a long time in the literature, incidentally, on European parties to be the case, and is plainly no longer the case, uh, 
I mean, I don't, I don't think any European, ma any major European political party now lives on either money from the state or its members, uh, at least at the top. The stuff has been hollowed out too much. But uh, public financing of elections really does make it possible for people who want to do the right thing to do it. They have zero chance if they are, as a friend of mine, for instance, works in Congress, and he was trying to get round up some representatives to vote. And he told me when he asked them to come, they said, one guy said, look, I've got a dial for dollars. This is going to cost me two hours of fundraising uh, to actually show up for a meeting to discuss a piece of legislation. I mean, those of you who are sort of interested in opportunity costs can sort of do this uh, calculation. When you look at the totals, you can divide by the number of days in the year. I mean, you get these fantastic numbers, how much you have to raise as a congressman or woman, how much as a senator. Uh, and, you know, it, it's truly a lot of money. So, I mean, my, my take is you, you, you have to deal with the public financing story. I certainly would try to insulate and professionalize regulators. Uh, and and I, I would just stop this process of going from the government to private interests. I mean, I, I think it's just unbearable the way Tony Blair has, for example, exploited his position every, all over the place. But the same with the Clintons. Uh, or uh, any number of other politicians. Uh, and you know, I'd put an end to that. I really would. I think they don't have to run for president. Nobody has a constitutional right to cash out of their office and do for it. So look, at, you look at the case of Bernanke. Ben Bernanke left the Fed. Uh, within about two weeks, he'd earned something like $200,000 in a dinner uh, thrown by seven uh, hedge fund or private equity folks. Uh, Tim Geithner's doing the same thing, and Geithner, you know, handed out so much cash to folks, he'll be raking in for the next uh, 30 years, just the AIG deal alone. But this stuff should be stopped. Uh, and, I mean, th that, I think, would, would help. Uh, but, um, again, uh, this is not a perfect solution. It is a warning that if you continue with, if you, if you have a kind of Alexandrian hierarchy in society where ordinary people are barely able to make their ends meet um, and can't uh, earn, you know, like just say they need to be able to find regular work at a salary that expands at some reasonable level. Any situation you've got where you can't do that, you're looking at a potentially pathological situation where the cash concentrates at the top. I mean, that's what you've got in both the U.S. and Western Europe right now. Well, let me ask a theoretical question. Um, your message was that big business has disenfranchised much of the voting public. And if it were possible to have a proposition be brought to the voters that campaigns should be financed publicly rather than privately, then that should gain a majority. Why does this not happen, and is it necessary for there to be huge conflicts of interest in the media in order for the present situation to perpetuate itself? All right, did people hear that question? Um, the question is about if it's so obviously sensible to have public financing, how come you don't have it? Um, and whether, what about conflicts in the media? All right, let me tell a few true stories here. First of all, <clears throat> there is in the U.S. right now a sort of active public financing movement. Um, there are sensible versions of that that won in some states, and I, in Maine, um, Arizona had one for a while, but I think it got repealed, and there's a couple others. And I do think that that's had some impact. Uh, but the national movement is pretty strange. I've had a few, eh, Frank, what they used to call in before 1989 in the old Soviet bloc, frank and comradely discussions uh, with people who claimed um, that the, uh, to be in favor of public financing, in particular various wealthy folks who said, oh, we're really in favor of this. And then I talked to them about what they were in favor of, and I found that they were essentially 
um, a number of people, some of whom were quite fabulously rich, said, yeah, we should stop corporations from contributing. But they thought there should be no restrictions on individual donors. I mean, I didn't have to be very smart to sort of see that would make the folks I was talking to the largest single donors in the United States. Um, I actually don't favor that type of approach. My sense is, is that there is a very deliberate effort in the Democratic Party to make some kind of Band-Aid reform here, but that the, ob the obvious move, and I think it actually would would pass in the United States. It would require a constitutional amendment, but I actually think if it would, you could get it through uh, the both houses of Congress, it would get ratified. I think this, most of the population sort of sees it. Um, you need to alter the Constitution to make sure it's clear that a reasonable effort to restrict spending in elections is not unconstitutional. There are a few drafts of that around. You're not going to see that one. Uh, and an awful lot of money is spent misdirecting folks right now. Um, I, I do notice in Western Europe, uh, in, for instance, in the case of, I mean, there, there are all kinds of folks, various French socialist mayors and things like that getting up and they were all denouncing that wealth tax, which I thought was stupid. Uh, it was too high that Hollande put on that, you know, what's it, Gerard Depardieu decamped first to Belgium and then to Russia, as I recall uh, there. Um, but uh, I don't, nobody is effectively making the case, I think, that I just made in any way that anybody can hear it much. Now, on the question of conflicts within the media, there's a problem. You know what it is as well as I, uh, as I do. Uh, you're dealing with a corporate media run by this really big business. I mean, this media is now some of the biggest business there is. And, you know, I, I would add, if you doubt this, just look at the stuff that comes out on the Murdoch uh, empire and its relations with British politicians in the last, I mean, the stuff there is just unbelievable uh, in the degree of detail and sort of fine tuning that goes on back and forth. Uh, there, you know, to expect a media like this to tell you a serious limitation on uh, campaign finance, it's just not going to happen. I mean, it's like, um, you know, I'll, I'd expect water to flow uphill before I'd see that. But for all that, I think the public opinion case is actually pretty favorable. I think most people are really sick uh, of big money in politics. I also think that's true. I mean, almost everywhere uh, I go in Europe, people are complaining that their politicians are corrupt, which they're almost always right on that. Um, and uh, they may not necessarily, they, don't some, they need sometimes some discussion of how do you make the link between public financing and ending corruption. Uh, but, you know, they, I think they mostly get it. This is one where I think the public is very far out in front of effectively all elites. Now, some work that is quite clearly uh, mo derivative from some stuff I've written in the U.S. has been published where they show you on public opinion if the, if the middle class and the poor agree on something and the upper income groups don't, it does not go through Congress. Uh, I actually think you can find substantial support below the level of 1%, in other words, a fair number of wealthy folks when you actually do direct polls of the super rich, Ben Page has a nice piece on this, you find they are very conservative indeed on political finance. I mean, they, re they really don't want to be restricted. Uh, and so I'm sorry on this one, Dennis, I fear there's not, it doesn't take much in the way of a conflict of the media, they only have to have that attitude that I was quoting at the start of my talk where there's no conflict, there's no interest, they've got a conflict and they've got a big interest. I only have one question. In American universities, is there anybody interested in studying uh, Alec Barton and Dick Cheney, that spe special model of influence in politics? Well, there is actually a uh, paper out by some improbable folks at, I think, MIT on Cheney's case. Um, or is that Columbia? I have to remember which. Um, there is some 
uh, I just haven't had time to do it. I actually wanted to do uh, an analysis. I, I, like lots of other people, remember the case, not at Cheney, but when the day Geithner was announced as Treasury Secretary, it was like Santa Claus had come into New York. The market rally was enormous, but it turns out now there is a paper on that, and firms that were close to Geithner went up way more than average. Um, so the answer is, uh, not absolutely sure who did the Cheney paper. There is one. I, my memory on that one was that I didn't agree with the way they did it, and they had a peculiar result. But yeah, there's a, there is some research, uh, not a lot. I'm sorry, but this is really the last, the last question, because we, we spend more time than usually. <laughs> I was just wondering what you thought about the connection between um, austerity ideology and the idea of demolishing uh, public funding uh, for, for parties and for politics, since this is a very up-to-date um, de public debate in Italy, as the, the main, what is said is we're, we, have, we have public funding and it's pretty big for our politics and so the, now the question is if, whether to abolish it because using the rhetoric of the fact that it's a waste of public money and, and a lot of time it brings corruption and all that stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um, Here's my, t I, I recall, Ren I might be wrong, and you can correct me, but I recall Renzi actually talking up this campaign, too, on changing those. Uh, um, I would regard that stuff with the greatest skepticism. Um, and I, I would, I, the, the, there's a point, though, behind the lady's question that actually needs a comment. It is true that the European systems generally put more public money into elections or into parties. The parties, as I did mention, often also have some fairly heavy dues. I was talking to a French socialist the other day, and she told me that she put in 250 bucks a year in party dues. That's a lot of, that, that's some real money. The thing is, uh, what I noticed, I noticed it back in the 80s, sort of casually, but uh, it's clear to me that the leaderships don't work on the basis of those. But it's sort of like one wants to compare the European party systems now almost to like lemon socialism uh, back around 1960 in Britain. That is to say, you got a lot of badly performing firms living on state cash uh, that don't act like they should. Um, the reason is, is that they just, the campaigns all need more. Every time you turn around, you just take the, the latest campaign scandal in France. What's that, 100 million, I think? Uh, and that's not Madame Betancourt's cash for Sarkozy. Um, these campaigns cost more money than they say they cost. Um, I think that is obvious in Italy. Uh, and as I sort of study the, I mean, I'm around enough that I get, I think, some fairly good sense for folks. The lifestyle of the average Euro leader these days, eh, it's not quite at a CEO level, but that's the standard to which they actually compare themselves and aspire. And one way or the other, they try to find the cash. Um, I mean, and I am extremely interested to watch the way Blair emulates the Clintons uh, and other, I mean, I was doing a little informal survey of like what happens to Danish prime ministers? And, you know, the answer is not that much. Uh, but that's Denmark. And Denmark has an altogether less unequal society than most. And yet it got, you know, 22% of the vote went to the right-wing party in the last uh, Euro election. But, hey, that's only 22%. My sense is, is that in societies marked by larger income disparities, the politicians are all comparing themselves to CEOs, and they actually uh, are going to find the cash. There was a wonderful tape of a, of a local election uh, candidate in Arizona who got actually indicted because she got taped. And she had, was just a fabulous line. She said, I need the money. I want to live the good life. Uh, and she, I think, went to jail. Um, I'm sorry to say I think this has taken hold in Europe. I actually think the accounting here is bad. Uh, the campaigns cost more. Periodically this finds out. 
and it's not enough. You, you get like in, Fran in France, you get these political clubs. Cash ends up in there. The folks in the clubs get the money. It doesn't show as campaign cash at all. Uh, there are also any number, well look, in Germany, essentially all the, uh, the conservative MPs, members of parliament, uh, seem to have two or three or four corporate directorships. A fair number of social democrats have that too. Um, there are all kinds of schemes. Um, you know, it depends on each country. There's a guy named Hans von Arnim that has really got a pretty good study of money in the German system, though I completely disagree with his remedies. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this, this, I think the situation is rapidly becoming impossible. Uh, and if people don't do something in a hurry, they're going to completely lose control of their states. Con questo forte applauso salutiamo il professor. I think we should put our hands together for Professor Ferguson. Thank you very much, Professor Ferguson. And we'd like also to thank the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And I wish you all uh, success with the Economics Festival. Thank you.